Hello everyone, welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, the 29th of October. Today's topic is Orange Slice Rubric. Our special guest today is Matt Buchanan. Our show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Uh, thanks to Patty Ruffing for doing not only the introduction to Collaborate that you can find on the website, but also the certificates for our shows. Here's the newbie question. Or wait, I have to let Susie introduce Matt first. Sorry about that, Susie. That's OK. Take it away. That's all right. Well, it's interesting. Uh, Matt and I are both Boilermakers, proud graduates of Purdue University. And we both live in Indiana. But I learned about Matt through friends in New Jersey. And I looked back in my tweets and things, and I started hearing about this orange slice rubric from Justin Slider, a PE teacher from New Jersey. And then I read a post that Joyce Valenza wrote, a great librarian, about orange rubric and all the great uh, things that you could use for the rubrics with students, not only on the teacher side, but also the student side. So when I did a little investigating, I found out, wait a minute, he's from my state. And he is a biology and earth science teacher at Angola High School. And I know some people at Angola High School, mainly through Twitter, but some I've met later on. And that just really intrigued me. And since uh, first learning about it, Matt has, um, keeps adapting and interacts with people that have questions about the rubrics. It integrates well with Google Classroom. He has many great tutorials. And since then, I've heard from people all over about how this is just a wonderful tool and that he is very willing to interact with people. So that's when I thought, we need to have him on the show. So I'm very excited to get to uh, be in part of this webinar and to have Matt share his great tool with all of you. And now for the newbie, newbie question. For Matt to tell us what are rubrics and how are they used to support learning. <laughs> My turn. <laughs> oh, what are rubrics and how are they used to support learning? Yes, Matt. That question is all yours. Oh, okay. <laughs> and we asked that qu that newbie question to kind of scaffold things for people, just in case they're not completely clear about the topic. And since your topic has to do with rubrics, we know you're an expert on that. So you can answer that question, and then you can jump into your slides. OK, yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Uh, first off, it's, again, my name is Matt Buchanan, and I'm from uh, Northeast Indiana area, originally from Fort Wayne. And um, I've been, I, I did a transition teaching to teaching probably about, uh, two, oh my gosh, it's been about seven or eight years ago now. And it was probably about uh, four, I'll get to this question, there'll be a question here in a second, just to introduce myself a little bit more. Um, it was basically through a need of necessity as I was needing to needing to quantify grades with uh, students' work as we were switching from one to one or to one to one. Um, because all the students were giving me this work and it was really nice work, but how do I put a grade on there? And that was really difficult because I could put an A on there. I could put a B, but it would be just, you know, a small lowercase a. But it needs to be more than that. It needs to be something more reflective of what the students are doing. So that's why I came up with the idea of creating an add-on. Um, I was just looking at doing it for myself. And um, something that looks very professional brings information to you, so it's not, it's not, I'm not waiting on it, it's more waiting on me as it was my focus. So that led me into, uh, into uh, the orange slice and the rubric. So the orange slice name, I saw someone ask, what's the origin of that? Why did I come up with orange slice? Because I really see probably like five or six different add-ons that I'd like to create that are, I feel are just as cool as orange slice teacher rubric. Um, and so I saw teacher rubric as being like one slice the orange, student rubric is another one. I, I might be working on another one this, this, uh, this fall, this uh, springtime, to release a, a third one. And there's, there's more. So each one is its own slice, and together they come and form an orange. So it's orange slice. Um, it's more about time now. Uh, the newbie question, what are rubrics and how are they used to support learning? 
Well, you know, I guess related to um, my story, and rubrics are a fantastic way of grading electronic documents. It's a way of doing it quickly. It's a way of giving students direct feedback. Um, it's a way of telling the students initially, these are my expectations. And typically students, and sometimes myself, you forget what's required, what's necessary, right? So you bring the rubric up, oh, those are my guides. That's what I need to achieve. That's what I need to do on this assignment. So you have that up front uh, so, the students, um, so the students know what, to, what the expectations are. Um, and then um, the way I've incorporated some features, we're going to look at some of those features here. How do they support learning? And more importantly, I'm focused on how does the teacher and the student work together? How, does, how can you use a rubric, these, these add-ons, to create this conversation with one-on-one -on -one with the student? What am I, what's the student doing and how do I constructively help them? How do we find root causes? How do we get down deeper to what the student's thinking? Because once the assignment is turned in and you grade it, right, to remember what happened two weeks ago can be difficult. So um, this was a way of doing that. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and jump into the presentation here. And it's all about quantifying student growth using uh, Orange Slice teacher rubric and student rubric. And the agenda here, I want to first talk about rubric categories because not everybody uh, uses rubrics, and if you're new to rubrics, then it can be kind of overwhelming. Um, how do I create these categories? What's a meaningful category? Because you have to change the way you think, change the way you grade, change your perspective. Uh, getting started with Orange Slice, how does the process begin? Because I'm not sure if everyone knows, so let's go through just a quick tutorial on that. Then we're going to go into the peer review and teach review, which is important for this part of quantifying a student's grade. Oh, and sorry, I just forgot. Um, this really is, I'm rolling this feature out um, with this, this program here with uh, Classroom 2.0 Live. So this is the first time this really has been talked about and discussed, so it's, it's a nice introduction for this feature. Uh, after the peer review and teach reviews, we're going to look at the final grade and the growth table. And then beginning the teacher-student conversation. That's the cool part right there. At least I find it the most cool. And then kind of Google Drive. What's the purpose of Google Drive? What's Google Drive's role in all this? And how does it save time for the teacher? So let's begin here, the rubric categories. You want to think about the big picture. You want to change your perspective from problem number two or question number two, sub-question that is 2A and 2A1, however deep you want to go with those. You know, was that one right or was it wrong? You you got to you got to step back from thinking about that specific uh, answer, that specific question, to the overall paper itself, to the overall work itself. And I say paper, I teach science, and so I'll have them do math, and I'll grade the math with this. I'll have them write uh, papers, so they're doing that. They're doing lab work also, so I use it really. It it, it works for me and anything I need to use it for. Uh, so what are my workhorses for rubric categories? And the first one is ideas. Uh, ideas. Clearly express multiple ideas to answer the question. So I want a student to be able to demonstrate that they understand all the different concepts and how those concepts work together or how they don't work together and a conversation on that. So if they can do that, then that communicates to me that, yeah, they really have a strong understanding of this content. So ideas is really an important one for me. Another one is organization. I look for my answers to be in paragraph format. And main idea, supporting details, conclusion. And what I like about this, because this is a step further from the assignment, this is thinking a bigger picture. If a student can take the ideas and concepts and then summarize them with a the main idea and then put together and support it with their details and then wrap it up with conclusion, it really communicates they've thought about it, they've had to work it through, and to come up with a, a paragraph that makes sense, it really demonstrates how much they've dug into the topic right there. It's also instant feedback for me as I'm reading through their work. Oh, they, they, don't, they don't get it, or they, do, they get it very well, or, oh, we need to clear up one small concept, and this would be flying. So organization is pretty good. Fluency is another one. Read smooth, uh, well thought out ideas. I don't use this one as much, but it's uh, for, the, for the longer work, I like to put fluency in there because, again, I want to set the expectations that not only do you understand the content, not only can you communicate the content, 
uh, in terms of the, the concepts, but can you communicate it fluently like you would in your, in your language arts class, in your English class? Because you, if you have an idea, once you get out in the real world, you've got to be able to speak clearly. If you don't speak clearly, then the ideas, as great as they are, may just fall off the table. So I feel this is really important. Um, it also just is more reflection into they've thought about it, they put the ideas together, and now they're starting to polish it and make it into something that's more of their own. So that's what I like about fluency. And the last one, this is kind of you still want to hang on to the tide of you know problem number two, question number two, is it right, is it wrong? Um, the um, the, uh, the uh, sorry here. Hey girls, could you please be quiet? I'm on this right now. Okay, so my girls are doing Saturday chores and we're working things out. Um, completion. So if you really want to still hang on to um, if you still want to hang on to problem number two, question number two, you can put completion. But even this one, you still have to let go and think about the big picture. Completion can only be, is it 90% right? Is it 80% right? Or answer, that is, 70% answered. You'll still have some students that come in and say, oh, well, to get an A, all I need to have 90% of them answered. So out of 10 questions, they'll, or 11 questions, they'll answer 10, leave one unanswered. So that kind of thing still happens, but then you go back to the ideas, or the communicating those ideas, is the organization, the way they're putting those ideas together clear, which really gets down to, did they understand or did they not, and then what can I do to help them? Okay, so that's my little uh, part on rubric categories. Uh, getting started, all right, the first thing you want to do is create a rubric, and I have a rubric here. You see I have ideas, presentation, fluency, organization. Uh, this is the the, uh, the categories that, that I'm using here for this one, and you can see on top there the uh, performance categories, the excellent, solid, average, etc. What's most, and, and these, these categories can be, and this rubric can be any size you like it to be. If you want to do it in just two performance columns, in other words, just excellent and solid, and that's it, great. If you don't call it excellent, you want to call it A and B, do that. If you want to call it, you know, whatever you want to do, just go ahead and do that, that's fine. Uh, the number of rubric categories, there can be one category, there can be 15 categories, you know, as, as many as you need. But I find the more categories you put, the longer the grading time. And, it, and then what's, what's the value? Is the student getting that value? Uh, the most important part here is rubric categories. You see in this rubric, it has rubric categories in the very first cell there. That's what the add-on uses to find your rubric. And this rubric can be anywhere within your document, the top, the middle, the end, wherever it works best for you. Um, oh, and then to um, uh, use this over and over again, you can just go into the document you initially created in and just copy and paste it into your next assignment. Um, so you can use it as much as you want or, or change it and modify it as you go. So it's really flexible that, that way. But I find that once you get the assignment set, next year you use the same assignment. And the rubric is already there. It's already set. It's already waiting on you. So it's just the initial time of, of putting rubrics in your documents there for the assignments. Okay, this is the important part here under save settings. We want to be able to select performance points, and I'm not going deep into this because um, uh, there's, there's videos on how to do this, but under performance points, we want to put, we want to click this one. This one says 0 to 5, yours may be 0 to 12 or 0 to 6. It basically says that the maximum score for any particular category in this one is uh, five points. We don't want to select the one down below which says passing levels A plus through D minus. That's the one where it sets the points for you. So if you don't want to figure that out, if you want a 13 point rubric and you want five categories, you just select that one. Um, otherwise, you want this one up here on top. And you want this one because we're quantifying, quantifying students, students' growth. Okay, um, And I think this is set up well, there should be some links there with some other videos that will help you with that. Distribution. So once you have your rubric in there and you opened up and you saved your settings, you want to distribute it. And Google Classroom, of course, works great. But remember, save the settings and all. Put your, put your rubric in there before you distribute the document. Otherwise, for each paper that's handed back in through Classroom, you'll have to, you'll have to insert um, the rubric and the, uh, the grade table in there. I've done that several times. So if you do that, send me an email. There's a quick way of doing it so it goes a little bit faster for you. OK, the student's journey. Let's look at the assignment here. We're really start getting into it. We need multiple reviews on this because if we're showing student growth, we need to be able to quantify initial and final, or initial 
and some spots in between and final. So we need that assignment looked at at least twice in order to be um, uh, to show growth. Uh, so we're going to use teacher rubric, we're going to use student rubric, and you only need one review before you do the final grade. That's that's the uh, important part to remember. Let's see. Okay, so we're going to start off here with the peer review. So the students basically finish their not finish their work. They, they reach a milestone or, or a stopping point. Students just exchange their Chromebooks, open up student rubric, and they perform the student rubric analysis there. I'm assuming you've you've used Orange Slice, um, but it brings up an add-on on the side over there, and it brings over uh, the each category, each performance level. You can select buttons. You'll, you'll see a picture or two coming up. This is the result of a student review here. And you can see, let me see here, you can see here in the score, the grade, it says C, average average category score. So I don't want students to be able to put a grade on another student's work, but I do want them to be able to put some indication. The average category score, your average performance level, in this particular case, is going to be average. Um, so the last one, the fourth category, must have been done there, needs help, number or 17 points. So you see the average categories would be in that one. So I want them to give them that feedback. There was also this, I mean, it's green down here, so it lets you know it's a student, re student review as opposed to a teacher review, which would be in orange. And up here, it gives you the date. It says peer reviewed, another indication that it has been student reviewed, what the average category score was, so you have that information. And then more specifically, the students can give each other specific feedback on categories. So you see here up on top there, it says ideas, and then down below in the rubric itself, it says ideas. So the note below there says make your paragraph longer. So in other words, this is guidance or feedback from their peer and what they gave them more specifically. And you can see they gave another one for organization, which was the fourth category down there. Nothing for presentation and fluency, but that's what the student, the peer, felt like they wanted to um, provide back to their, to their peer. Okay, so that's one step. Okay, so the student then does some work on it, and then now it's time for the teacher to review it. Okay, in this one, we're going to select the categories, and this is a snapshot right here of the add-on on the sidebar on the side. And you see it says in the top there, it says grades. I think you can probably see my cursor here. It says grades. Um, it shows grades, and then the first category is ideas. And the first category, the performance level is excellent. And what do you need to do to be in the excellent category? You need to, to reach this level right here, which is document in your rubric. The next level is solid, and then what do you need to do to reach the solid level right there? So you, you select the categories you want to review, and you don't have to select all of them, just the ones you want to review. And this one we're doing, as it says, ideas and presentation. Um, and then you select the performance level. It was solid uh, 18 points for each of those. And then the next thing you want to do is provide the student feedback. This is not mandatory. It's only if you want to. And you can see in this button, you see this button right here, that it'll, it'll pop up this window. Otherwise, this window goes away. And then you can provide the student feedback. OK, so the next thing you want to do, after you put all your information there, now you want to go ahead at the very bottom, you want to select process review. And process review is the one that reviews it as opposed to the other one, which is process grade. If you want to have a conclusion with a final grade, you select process grade. Otherwise, we're reviewing it. So you want to select process review in this step. What does that do? What does that look like? The rubric changes at this point. And in our rubric, you can see initially for ideas that the student, the peer, gave a grade of an average, but maybe some more work is done, I'm not sure. Uh, but the teacher sees it more in this region right here, more in the solid. Same thing with presentation. So we're already starting to see, if I get this right, we're already starting to see a visual growth. They haven't quantified the growth, but we've seen this visual growth going from average to solid. But also notice down here, fluency and organization. There is nothing orange there, so the teacher didn't provide any feedback for that. Maybe the teacher's focus is just ideas and presentation on this assignment. The next one, it may be fluency or you know whatever it needs to be. Or maybe it's all four whatever you like it to be. Uh, and you can see the older uh, student rubric scores here, they're in the lighter green right here. So that documented history is still present there. And, and it's important to capture that history because this history is telling the student's journey, which will help us in the end conversation. OK, at the very top of the grade table up there, you see before we had peer review down there. There's ideas and organization and feedback. But now we're introducing the student growth table. And in the student growth table, we see ideas and presentation, the two categories that we had selected 
I'm going to go back one here or two. You see we just selected ideas and presentations. So those are the two that are going to show up here. And you see they have an initial score of 18. This is why it needs to be reviewed at least once. We have an initial score of 18 and then the feedback that we wrote in the in the uh, the add-on is now put up here. It's put up here in a really nice formal presentation where the student can actually see, okay, my score was an 18. What do I need to do for ideas to improve that? Well, it says relate ideas from the internet sources with the book's concept. So, so oh yeah, okay, I need to work on that. So it's it's a way to give the student direct feedback. Matt, and, 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 I, I, yes. I'd like to interrupt just briefly. Uh, Maureen asked the question and then it was followed up by somebody else that that's probably a good thing to jump in with at this okay. point. Are the student documents turned in in Google Classroom? You mentioned yes. that they, they exchanged Chromebooks to do the peer review. So Yes, let me explain mm -hmm. that. For the peer review, for student rubric, that's not turned in. The students have that. They haven't turned it in yet. Okay. The teacher review, that one they've clicked turned in on that one. Okay, and that's then on Google Drive. Yes, and then what the student does after the review happens, the student will go in and they'll click unsubmit, which gives mm -hmm. them back right access and they can go ahead and continue the document. And can students have more than one peer review? Yes. Oh, yeah. They they can. Yeah, they can have everyone, the whole class, do it. Mm -hmm. And each time they'll do it, they'll have this down here. It'll say the date. It'll say peer reviewed, and it will give the new feedback. Okay, so there are are students then writing on each other's documents when Correct. they exchange the Chromebook. Okay. Correct. And they just they just have not on the document itself, but just but in write, the rubric part. Yeah, on the on the sidebar when students rubric opens up at the sidebar and in that sidebar they can write in there and then when they hit peer review it then captures what they've written in the table down here. Okay. So th this is another clarification. The reviews show up on the student view only on that copy and then they unsubmit and edit they can edit their their work again. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, good. Thank you for stopping me. Okay. All right. So I think we're pretty good with this part right here. Uh, okay. So additional reviews. So you can send it back out if you want to have other student reviews or peer reviews. And that's before they've submitted it to you again. Or if you want to do a teacher review again, you can have them submit the document to you again. And that way you have right access to it. When it's completed, then they, you can let them know and they can click unsubmit and they can take the document and um, begin to do their work on it. Okay, so all right, we've gone through a review process. Let's look at the final grade. It walks through many of the same steps right here. We want to select all the categories and this is a snapshot of each of the four categories right there. And we want to select the score, the grades for each of those categories, ideas, they moved up to an excellent presentation, still a, a solid 18, and it goes on down from there. And then you also have the option if you want to provide category feedback as before. You can write specific notes in there. So for example, ideas, very nice job comparing and contrasting ideas from different sources. Um, and then um, another one for organization. Presentation and fluency, I left, left those two blank, but again, you can put those in there if you like. All right, so now we want to go ahead and select process grade. Before we selected process review, but this is not the review. We're going to have final grade, so we want to select process grade and not process review. If you select process review, it's all right. It'll just do its thing, and then if you don't want it up there, that record, you can go ahead and hit undo like you normally do for anything in Google Docs. It will undo all that's been done. Then go back and hit process grade. And you'll end up with a rubric that looks like this. And you can begin to see some more growth, visual growth here, not quantified yet, but visual growth yet. And we see in the very first one here, ideas and presentation. Initially, the student, the peer review was around average. The teacher then had a review was solid, it was 18. And then lastly, at the final grade point, the student moved to an excellent. So for your visual learners, this is a nice transition to see right here. So we see their, their, their journey to this assignment. Sometimes you have them move back. And this is typical 
when you have a student review, a peer review, um, sometimes the students are more, more optimistic and more forgiving, um, provide more latitude with their peers. So this happens more often, more than you'd expect or um, it's, it's, it happens. Uh, the last one down here, this one there's no change right there. So what their peer said and what the final grade was is the same exact score there was a solid. Um, yes, and yeah, okay, I think that works pretty good. All right, so let's take a look at this here. We've got the, uh, the final grade and, and what information is on here. And we have ideas and presentation because we've reviewed those before down here as a teacher, see the initial is 18. We now see that there's growth here. We're starting to quantify the growth. Ideas went from an 18 to 20 points, so there was a net gain of plus two points. Presentation was 18 before initially. It's still at 18, so the net gain there is zero points. And then there's specific feedback here. In addition to that, there's organization. And organization has feedback up here on top. It's not in the table because we never selected organization as a teacher to say, I want to review this one. So it doesn't get put in the student growth table because there's only one data point and you're at the final grade. You can't do a comparison. You can't do growth because you haven't looked at it. This is the first time you've looked at it. So you put the feedback up here up, up on top. Okay, so here's, here's the part that's really cool and you really get down into the, the nitty gritty, the root cause analysis, if you will. This, this uh, teacher-student conversation, it, it, it leverages this history, which is so important. And let's take a look, what do we have? We have three different reviews. At the bottom, on the 18th, we have a peer review. On the 23rd, we have a teacher review. And lastly, on the 28th, we see graded. So we see this progression that's been captured and documented here, this history. So let's take a look at one of these categories. One of them is ideas. We can see in each of these three, um, um, what do you call it? Each of these three graded times, I guess, or review times, it's, it's included in each one. And we see here that we, the student down here said, make your paragraph longer. I, uh, on the 23rd, the teacher review, relate ideas from internet source with the books and the concepts. And finally, up here at the top, we see that there's a growth up here of, sorry, of 18 to 20 points of plus two, and very nice job. So there's a nice place to celebrate. You can really see that growth that student went through as they matured their ideas, which is also a great indication to they understand the content, how well can they apply it. So it's really positive. It's a great way to build. Let's take a look at presentation. We can see we're at 18, and then at the uh, final grade there on the 28th, we're still at 18. So we have this question, why is there no growth here? And you have, like I do, we have many students, and you remember every conversation. Well, I don't always remember, but it's nice to know specifically we have a root cause right here. Why is there not a change? Well, there's presentation information given back to teacher review. I understand you're not finished. However, add some introductory clauses to help guide the reader through. So now when you get the student and you have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, you can now say your presentation score didn't increase. Back on the 23rd, we had a conversation or some feedback here about clauses and how clauses can help your presentation and increase the fluency of it. So what were you thinking? And so it gives you a starting point um, to understand your students. I think that's, that's pretty awesome and pretty powerful right there. There's also this one up here up on top. It says organization. So many of the paragraphs are missing conclusion sentences for the A. But also look what's down here at the bottom. In the very beginning, organization, you need more supporting details. So this is a great time to have a conversation on how do you take ideas? How do you think about them? How do you put those into a summary sentence? How do you have supporting details that support that summary sentence? And how do you conclude that? And how do you really wrap it together in a nice package that says, not only do I clearly understand, but here's what I think about it. So this is where you can relate something that happened on the 18th of October all the way to the 28th of October. That documented history is there. It's not showing a quantitative growth, but it's definitely showing the beginning of a conversation to help that student next time with the next assignment so they can grow and improve. So I think those two, two things are pretty cool in what this shows here. Um, I'm going to take a step from this and go into Google Drive here for a second. And maybe this is too much information. This, this may be uh, overload right now. Uh, but Google Drive with managing assignments because 
uh, classroom, there's just so much there, uh, so many clicks. If you go to Google Drive, you can really manage your work uh, workload at a much faster pace. And you can see using Orange Slice Teacher Rubric, I can quickly see in Google Drive in the folder for this assignment who has their assignment graded. Not only that, the grades are listed in alphabetical order. See, there's D, F, H, 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 M. You know, goes on down from there, and the grades here on the side. So I can, it's, it's a way to manage who's done what. Also, I can see who has not completed their work. Very clearly, I can see because there's no graded in front of there. It's still the opening status. Their name is here. Oops, I see I need to make an adjustment over there as the student's name pops through. And then lastly, who's had their work returned? So immediately, from a top level perspective, I know who's done, what their grade was, I know who hasn't started, I know who's submitted the work, it's been returned, and they need to spend more time working on it, so I need to touch base with them. So there's a lot of information that can be um, gleaned or, or, or guide you using Google Drive here. And there's more that can be said about that, but I'll, I'll, it's a good, good stopping point there. Um, but the overall, um, presentation here, it's about this quantitative student growth and how it leads to this conversation. And we see with presentation going from 18 to 18 points, why? What's the root cause? It leads us back to the history when earlier conversations were documented and we can use that as our starting point for the next conversation with the student. How can we grow them academically? So that's uh, the presentation there. Are there, are there questions? Yes, there are, Matt. I did capture some questions. Uh, so are only the teacher's points the ones actually counted towards a grade and not the student? Okay. Uh, yes, that's correct. Yes. And the reason for that is because the students, they don't always have the rubric right. mastered like you want them to. Sure, yeah. okay. Um, let's see. Do you now find that you have assignments or projects in greater depth rather than a lot of different assignments? Uh, greater depth. What does does what we mean by depth? You mean like content depth, like a more meaning, more more. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I I would say so definitely, um, because I I spent I spent with me with myself I. I how do I say this? Um, so, like for example, yeah, I would say yes. And here's an example. So, when I do my earth science class, uh, we had there may be four sections in the chapter. And so, after each section, I had the students come up with their own question, and we'd use a a concept map. And then from the concept map, they can get their supporting details. They have to put it together with a main idea, and so and then wrap it up with a conclusion. And so, when I get those and I receive those back, I do these checks throughout throughout the chapter. I, I understand very more specifically where they're at, and I can spend more time with them during labs, helping them clear up earlier conversations and concepts they didn't quite grasp. So yeah, I feel like I don't have to offer as many assignments because the ones I get, I, I feel like I, I know them more and what they're thinking, which mm -hmm. is, I like that. Sure. How much time does it take to go through that entire process? Mm -hmm. uh, including the, the progress updates? So um, it, pro it, it takes to go through, one of, so once you get going, it moves pretty fast because you've got the categories on the side right there. Mm -hmm. And I generally have three, maybe four categories, but typically only three categories. That's pretty thorough for me. And plus more than that, it really becomes overwhelming for the students to put the whole thing together on normal assignments. Mm -hmm. um, I would say you could go through an assignment and probably, you know, I don't know, maybe from 30 seconds to two minutes, something of that nature. Mm -hmm. So you're going through, click, 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 and then write a couple comments and then hit process grade or process review. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, this, now this one, this, this program is an add-on. You have to open it up for each document. And the way to save some time with that is I, I typically open up like six or seven student documents, and then with each one I go through and say, you know, open teacher rubric, open teacher rubric, open teacher rubric, and then go back to the first one. By, by the time I return the first one, 
teach rubric is open so I can just start grading it, click the next assignment, grade it. By the time mm -hmm. I've gone through about five or six, I kind of need like a you know two minute break myself just to look around the room, let my eyes adjust, and that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. And what about with um, a specific student assignment? So once once you start an assignment with students, and they know they're going to be using this, of course they probably need some direction on how to do that, but how long does it take to go from assigning mm -hmm. the the whatever it is, a lab or whatever the project is, until they they get a grade? Yeah. Okay. So I I've thrown basically everything right. out there for this particular assignment. You can just totally skip the student rubric mm -hmm. portion of it, the peer review. In fact, I only do a peer review. My, my purpose of doing peer reviews is really to introduce a rubric and so the students get it acclimated with the rubric so they know what the expectations are. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so I may use a, 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 student, a peer review maybe you know, once, a, once a quarter, that kind of thing, uh, maybe twice, not too often. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the, students, so the students really don't have to, if you don't do a, a student review, the students don't have to know about this at all. In fact, they just get the assignment through Classroom. What mm -hmm. that? And I put my rubric at the very top of the assignment. So initially they see the rubric, okay, and I review the rubric, and then they just start working on the assignment just like they would any other assignment. So the duration of time is the same for mm -hmm. them. And when they're done, they click Submit in Google Drive. And then I'll go through and I'll open up Teach Rubric, as I said, maybe five at a time. And I'll just start grading and hit Process Grade and boom. It, mm -hmm. it, it takes the rubric score and turns it into an actual percentage or points, whatever you need it to be there. Um, so I, it goes pretty, it goes pretty fast. But if you want to do a bigger project like this with these multiple reviews, it, it, it will take a little more time. Clearly, sure. But, yeah, and I hope I've answered that question well. Yeah, I, I think so. I think that was the original intent of the of the participants' question. Okay. Um, here's another peer review question: Can you do peer reviews by sharing the document? Or do you need to actually share the Chromebook? Yeah, um, you can you can share the document, but I if I remember right, and there may be a setting you have to change in classroom. But for a student to share their document with another student, they need permission from the teacher. So maybe you can send it out that they can actually share it. But I don't like to do that because mm -hmm. it's easy for them to cut and paste. Right. Sure. Um, yeah, otherwise I'm getting a list of emails sent to me that says, can so-and-so share with so-and-so, mm -hmm. and that doesn't do anybody any good, right? Right. So yeah. it's, it's just as easy to just take your laptop, your Chromebook, and then give it to your partner, and, and they just exchange them, and they, they, they just do it. Um, but if you, if you want to go through that process, or if you prefer that process, oh, that, that door is wide open for you. Mm -hmm. OK, I've got, I've got some other questions here. Um, somebody asked early on, can you explain some about how the math calculation works with the rubric? To I calculate calculate a grade. I can. It's um, so yeah. Let's let me go back in the presentation. Can I do that? Is that all right. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. You could also screen share if you wanted to. Uh, uh, we'll, just, we'll just stop with this one right here. This one works right here. Okay. So you, you can see in this one the orange is the teacher with the student with the teacher rubric, and the green is where the, the uh, student rubric was at. Mm -hmm. So the orange here for ideas, you see, it says 20 points right there. So the program will go will go in and it will find this highlighted cell right here is orange. It'll go up and find oh, there's 20 points. So tally that one 20. Mm -hmm. You go to the next one over here, this one's orange, it comes up, it says this one's solid 18 points, so now it's 20 plus 18. And then for the same for this one and the same for that. So you end up with this, this, this sum of score, the sum of points. And once you have the sum of points, clearly it's just as simple to get the percentage. You take the sum of points um, and get the percentage of that from 20, 20 times 4, which is going to be uh, 80 points. So from that you can get your percent as well as your point score in this assignment. Mm -hmm. So in this particular rubric, you could actually have 
a score of zero since there's a category that says zero. Correct, Correct yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a good point there. Uh, I've got this broken down 20, 18, 16, right. 17. You can make it, now 20 has to be the case because it's it's an 80 point assignment, this one here. Mm -hmm. So if you click all of these, you're, you're expecting to see 80 points. But you can make this one here solid. You can make this 15 points. You can make average 10 points. Needs help, you can make that one point. You know, whatever mm -hmm. the number of points you want to put in there. And then return over here, this can actually be uh, 12 points. You know, whatever, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. So, so you weight the assignment. These categories, each of them by themselves, are the same number, but you put weights in with the, the breakdowns within a category. Yes, and, and the vocabulary I want to change a little bit, not the weights, uh, but the, the performance score is mm -hmm. up here, okay. 20 points. But if you want, if you want ideas to be weighted. Uh, two thirds of the overall assignment. You can do that within within Teacher Rubric, and those videos will walk you through on how to set that up. Mm -hmm. But in this particular rubric here, ideas, presentation, fluency, and organization, they're each worth twenty five percent of the overall assignment. Hmm. Somebody asked, can you eliminate the points altogether and just use it as an anecdotal document? Yes, this you can. Teacher can't assign grades or levels in the yes. feedback page. Yes, yes, you can do that. Um, and in the very beginning, I talked about the um, you have to put a zero to five points. You have to click that one under uh, performance points. Uh, there's one down below where it says A plus to D minus. And that one, you just put the, um, the pass fail percentage in the, in the program itself. And then your rubric headings up there. Like it says in this one, excellent solid average. You could take the points off completely and just have it say excellent, and it were just mm -hmm. solid, and it will calculate it for you. Okay, so it does it does do the the math calculation on its own. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. 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 Yeah, it does it on your own. Its own. Uh, is there? A difference between the teacher rubric add-on and the student rubric add-on? Good question. Yes, there is. There's a big difference. The student rubric is a stripped-down version of teacher rubric. Mm -hmm. so teacher rubric, you'll end up with a grade. You'll be able to set settings. You'll be able to do things like if there's a late penalty, if you want to mm -hmm. give extra credit, if there's plagiarism. You know, what do you want to do with that? Um, you can manage that in teacher rubric. Student rubric. The only thing they can do is make selections for each category and select peer review. And then it will color it green in the rubric for the scores. And then in the grade table at the top, it will say, this is your average category score as opposed to a final grade. Mm -hmm. OK. So as a teacher, you wouldn't necessarily need both the teacher rubric and the student rubric. Yes, that's correct. Correct. OK. Uh, somebody also here calculated the uh, needs help average compared, the, the total of this compared to the 80 points, and uh -huh. that works out to be an 85%. There's a question mark after that. Uh, a B average for needing help? Oh, well, yeah. I, I, I'm looking at that now. It says mm -hmm. 2018, mm -hmm. 60, and then it jumps up to 17. So mm -hmm. I just randomly put those numbers in. Okay. I, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about that when I, put, when I made this up. OK. That's, that's a very good point, yes. Uh, somebody also had a lengthy comment here about, uh, he says, this is quite interesting. The student review consists of what we call performance criteria, the actual yeah. specifics of content and skill that have to be demonstrated. This teacher likes the fusion of this option within Google Classroom. One point of departure I will have to think about is what we don't, is that we don't quantify criteria. Still, I like the interaction of the, of the teacher and student review. So and in that one, if, if, they send, if they send it out so that it is, um, uh, you know, I'm not sure about the screen share. Can I go right to, I bet I could probably do this here. Screen share yeah. is is the the button right next to the one above where it says new page, the one I in got, the middle. 
Mm -hmm. I got lucky. That's the exact slide I'm looking for. Okay. So, yeah, if they want to do that, they need to select this one down here, passing levels A plus through D minus. And, it, and that one, it will just, it won't put a score on there. It'll just, if you had your, your, your performance columns there, if it just says, um, you know, super and duper and good, and then their, their average is the duper, it'll just say your average column score is duper. So it mm -hmm. won't be anything like, it won't be a, a score. Okay. But, yeah. So it almost gets it there for what she wants, I think, or he. Is there a way to determine mastery using the rubric? Well, I think um, that would be implied by the rubric itself, the very first column there. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, if they were all checked or all selected. That's correct, yeah. If they yeah. were all excellent all the way down, they would say there would mm -hmm. be mastery. And if there's like above and beyond mastery, then the, within teacher rubric, there's also an extra credit option to assign mm -hmm. any number of percentage points you want to add to it. Great. How does this type of feedback compare to Jozu or Kaizena? Kate Kaizena, yeah. Aside yeah, Kaizena. from the, the demonstration table. Yeah, Kaizena I can speak to, and that one is it's it's um, as I understand it, it's all recorded audio. So mm -hmm. you can, like, maybe you can click on a certain spot and, and record audio and stick it there. Mm -hmm. uh, Jozu, I'm not sure. I haven't dug into that one and to see how it compares. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like um, I've seen a little bit about Jozu. They uh, they have these these boilerplate responses. So when I have mine in there, you can actually type in specifically what you want to say. You probably can do the same mm -hmm. thing as Jozu. They also have the option you can give a boilerplate response. Um, you know, you, you need to work on this. But I've, and I don't know it that well, but it, the concept seems kind of. I mean, I, I appreciate it from a teacher point of view because I'm typing this over and over again. Mm -hmm. But the other part is. It's really just restating the rubric ca performance category itself. The performance category says main idea, three supporting details, and a conclusion, and there's no conclusion. I could have a boilerplate that says no conclusion, or they could just re look at the rubric. Uh, you know, it, it, if it doesn't work with looking at the rubric, how can mm -hmm. a boilerplate answer also work? Right. Yeah, I don't know if that makes sense. But. Yeah, it, it does, because it, it's very much like a, an individual mm -hmm. process per student. And if you go to a boilerplate answer, that takes away from that. Yeah, yeah. So students need that individual attention. Exactly. Right. Can you use this as a template to create a lot of different rubrics? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can use this as a template. And like I was saying, you can add more categories, you mm -hmm. can add less add more performance um, criteria in there or less, you know, whatever you want it to be. The most important thing is rubric categories is in the very first cell. Mm -hmm. And it will read it then. So go play. That's great. Those were the questions that I was able to capture and ask since I started asking. Um, I'm not sure if there are any others from people in the in the session. You can go ahead and type in chat. Do you have any tutorials on how to choose categories to create the rubric? Um, um, let me think about this here. I, I have I have on the on the Google Plus my Google Plus page. Mm -hmm. There is a, a subgroup within that about different categories and why I like specific categories. So here I talked about ideas for a little bit. And that one I do, I provide more enrichment of ideas. I provide more examples of, of why I think it's good. Um, as well as there's probably about six or seven other ones in there too. So on my Google Plus page, you can find it within there. I'll probably, I'll probably put a link to it somewhere here. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's, that's um, I'm assuming that person is someone that's just stepping into rubrics for the first time or thinking about doing it. So um, let it be a growth process, right? Mm -hmm. Let it be something you transition to one step at a time, and each time you get more truer into what you want to be, what you want the assignment to be and the, the interaction to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is also a relevant comment. One of the tricky things on a rubric, though, is that 
if you start specifying that three points is excellent, two is solid, etc., that one is not necessarily evaluating the quality of the points. Student A could list three weak and unsupported clauses, while student B could list one sophisticated clause and develop a thoughtful explanation. Technically, student A has met the rubric data on the level of quantity. So the yeah, the categories do have to require careful phrasing. Yes, yes. You know that yeah, exactly. And I, I run into that. That that mm -hmm. happens. Um, you know, and, and so what I do on those, because you know, so I put this rubric out there. It's not mm -hmm. like it's I mean it, I don't want to say it, it's like it's not set in stone. You're still the teacher and you can still say, No, wait a minute. Okay, I see what you're doing here. This is, this isn't this isn't meeting the intent, mm -hmm. right? And so you can give it back to them. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, you've met the requirements. Yeah, you have. I'm looking for six sentences, and you gave me six sentences. But there's not coherence. Mm -hmm. And so my job as a teacher is to eliminate obstacles for you, is to, to understand that you know everything. So I'm preparing you for the task and preparing you to know this information. And what you've given me, I, I, can't, I can't determine that. And, can, mm -hmm. and it's a conversation with a student. Can you explain to me how this, how this tells me you understand the material? And right there, the dialogue dialogue begins, right? Sure. And so then, you know, it, it, you, you know, it doesn't doesn't have to be set in stone in that sense. It can always be a wait a minute, time out, and let's have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Terrific, great, mm -hmm. Matt. Thanks so much. I think those were all the questions that I saw, and let's get back to that questions page. Sorry about that. Okay, I should have remembered the number it was on. It would, be, would have been easier to jump, but it's I didn't. Probably in the 80s. Okay, we're getting closer. Yeah, you're real close now. Great, okay. Thanks again so much, Matt. I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy, who's going to talk about a virtual conference first, and then what's coming up next. Okay. Thank you so much, Matt. Wow, what an awesome tool you have created. And this tutorial is going to help everyone even if they couldn't be with us today. I know I, for one, am going to watch it all the way through and pause as we go along. So thank you for sharing with us today. I want to tell all of you about the K-12 online conference. If you're not aware of it, the format is changing this year. And it's not going to be two weeks long of daily uh, presentations, but it's going to a mini conference format. And I want to tell you about it now because it's coming up really soon. The opening keynote is Monday, October 31st, and Julie Lindsay is the keynote. And she has some amazing things to share. And the great thing is all of these keynotes are asynchronous. That means you can watch them anytime you have time. You don't have to log in at a certain time. And then following every keynote, there's going to be a panel conversation about that keynote topic. And that one will be asynchronous. So it will spread out over time from the beginning of October through the end or through early April. So you'll be able to pace that out, but you can always go back and watch the recordings anytime you'd like. So this is um, Julie's keynote, and she has created three separate video presentations that you'll be able to watch. You can watch them straight through. They're not long, I, I mean, maybe about 20 minutes. Um, or you can watch them in parts. And then she's going to follow that with her panel discussion about her presentation and all of her topics that relate to collaboration and being a global educator. So the panel is November 3rd. So that's uh, the same week following 
her keynote. And you can see she's got some great people joining her on the panel for that conversation. And all of us will be able to ask questions in the chat and contribute to that conversation. We also have added a Voxer um, group for the K-12 online conference. And you can join that any time if you'd like to ask a question about the conference or if you'd like to continue the conversation about something you've seen or heard there. We're really excited about enhancing the conference in that way so that um, the conversation is easier to continue. If you haven't used Boxer, Boxer you're going to want to explore that because they're just short little comments, minute or two usually, um, but they really enrich uh, what you're learning. And then I do want to let all of you know we have some great shows coming up on Classroom 2.0 Live. And next week, Craig Yen is going to be with us talking about becoming a connected educator. And he's going to share all kinds of tips about how he manages his social media, especially Twitter, to collaborate with other people, get it set up so it's manageable, all that kind of stuff. November 12th, Alexis Kobo is going to be here to help us kick off the Hour of Code Week and Computational Thinking, which uh, Hour of Code comes in December. And November 19th, we have a great presentation about a new source called PikaPack. And they're the co-founders of that, it's a, co a character education program for younger students, pre-K through grade three. And their co-founders are going to be with us to tell us all about that tool and how you can use it with your students. And then we'll take November 26th off for uh, Thanksgiving weekend in the United States. And then we'll be back the beginning of December. So I hope you'll all join us for as many of those as you can. And we'll be recording all of them. Thanks, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Harkadon's latest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including host your own webinar where you can sign up for a public Blackboard Collaborate session for free. You can nominate a featured teacher at this form or from within the Live Binder, or you can nominate yourself as a feature teacher. We have a feature teacher each month. As you exit the session, the survey should open. You can go from the direct link or from within the chat box or the log or in the Live Binder. And when you complete the survey, you can request a professional development certificate. Uh, these now print out with your name, thanks to Patty Ruffin. And Please, though, use a personal email address, not a school email address. Schools tend to block this from arriving. Special thanks to our special guest, Matt Buchanan, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>